All right, so we're ready to begin with the second part of our uh, evening with the talk by Dr. Mario Ensler. Um, back when I was a young deacon, if, if you go back and look at the picture with me, that was about four months before I was ordained a deacon, uh, that you see a picture of me there with the Pope. And uh, my first assignment uh, as, a de as an ordained minister, as a deacon, was at uh, St. Bernard's in Keene. Uh, I then was assigned as a priest for four years at St. Michael's in Exeter and then St. Mary's in Newmarket. And then I got assigned again in Keene at uh, St. Bernard's and four other churches uh, for another year. And in the midst of that, I got to know uh, the Ensler family a little bit throughout all this. Uh, certainly it was a powerful thing to to know that we had a papal guard in, in the audience, uh, in the congregation, I should say. And certainly it made me think twice about what I was saying in my homilies. But uh, so it is truly a pleasure to be able to see him again after uh, a long time. And uh, I, I know that he's going to be able to share some incredible stories with us and some insights about John Paul II. So uh, without further ado, Dr. Mario Ensler. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's, uh, it is true that I've known Father Vaughn since both of us, we had hairs. <laughs> <laughs> okay, since we are all Catholic, why don't we start with a prayer? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Lord, may we be inspired by the example of the saints, especially Saint Pope John Paul II. And may we learn to proclaim what he believed. And may we learn to put his teachings into actions. And may our offering bring always honor to your name. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So it's great to be back to New in New Hampshire. As a matter of fact, I want to take uh, 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 granted by the fact that I am the one that brought this rise in temperature because I come from Texas. And so we have 90 degrees there. And I said, God, give me 15 to bring to New Hampshire. All right? And so, and, uh, and yes, Father Vaughn, I think he contacted me almost a year ago saying, are you doing something about the celebration of St. Paul John Paul II. And I, had, I hadn't thought about it yet. And I said, no, why? And he says, well, would you mind come to St. Patrick? And I said, well, first of all, I've never been to the Pelham, Selham, Wellam, this area of <laughs> New Hampshire. And second of all, I said, yes, absolutely, why not? Well, a lot has happened in the past 11 months since when we talked, right? First of all, I was living in D.C. at that time. Okay, now I live in Houston, Texas. I was able to see your faces, now I can't, all right? <laughs> and uh, living in Texas, the last comment that I heard that really caught my attention was, gee, 50 years ago we sent a man to the moon and now we cannot take care of a cold. <laughs> so I've been, you know, thinking, okay, what can I do in my simplicity? I used to be raggedy handsome, I used to have a six-pack, now I carry a six-pack <laughs> when I come out of grocery store. And I said, what can I do? Well, I can bring hope. And to bring hope, I have an easy job because all I have to do, I have to talk about my former boss, somebody that I served first as a Swiss guard for 40 months, so a little more, just three and a half years, but then he called me to become a financial advisor. And so I basically served him again until 2005 when he passed away. So I got to know the man quite well, as well as he got to know me, unfortunately, quite well as well. But serving him was such a privilege and it was such a grace to be near him that I today, many years later, I feel duty bound to talk about it and to share my experiences 
with others. And so, first of all, who was Joseph Karol Wojtyła? Well, he was a Polish dude that was born on May 18, 1920. Guess what? I married a woman from New Hampshire. That's May. Her birthday is May 18. Not 1920, <laughs> but May 18. Her mom, her name is Pat. Her birthday is October 22nd, today. So tell me if this is a coincidence or if God had planned it, all of it. So born in 1920, May 18 in Vadovice, not many people are aware of the fact that he had a sister, Olga, and she was born and died before he was born, so he never met her, okay? Then he had a brother, Edmund, and his brother died when Carol was 12. His mom died when he was nine, and his father died when he was 21, in the middle of World War II, 1941. So imagine he was alone in Poland. I know that we don't study a lot of Western civilization history here, but think about it. He was alone in Poland in the middle of World War II. And as a young student, and there are a lot of biographies out there, but uh, as a young student, he was thrilled by three things. And that's what he says, that's where I stand, that's my stool. He loved to stand on that stool with these three legs. And what were these three things? Literature, theater, and poetry. Those were the three legs of the stool where he loved and so tonight, I'm going to hold your hands and I'm going to take you through these stories of events and circumstances, some of whom have me involved. But first, I'm going to start in July 1958. Some of you were born. I wasn't yet. But in July 1948, it's when we can say clearly that he began a new stage in his journey with the Lord. Why July 1958? Because he had gone to the Mazuri Lake, that's in Slesia, the southern part of Poland, for his usual vacation with a group of young adults that loved to canoeing and hiking. He loved spending time with young adults. And he brought with himself a letter that the primate of Poland, Cardinal Stephen Wyczynski, had sent him. He didn't want to open that letter before he went canoeing in vacation, but he brought it with him because he had an idea, he had a suspicious of the content of that letter, but he didn't want to open it to ruin his vacation. And so on the last day of the trip, while he was around the campfire with his wonderful young students, he opened the letter, and yes, the letter was calling him to be appointed as the auxiliary bishop of Krakow. Age of 38, he became a bishop, an auxiliary bishop in Krakow. Now think for a moment what that meant for him. Living is challenging engagement with young people. Living the academic world. Living the great intellectual endeavor of striving to understand the mystery of that creature which is man and of communicating to the world the Christian interpretation of our being. Leaving all of that must have seemed to him, in my personal opinion, like losing his very self. Losing what had become the very human identity of that young priest. 
But guess what? He chose to serve the Lord. He accepted that appointment for he heard in that call the voice of Christ. Twenty years later, I fast forward, so 42 years ago, as Father said, October 1978, you heard again the voice of the Lord. And I always tell everybody, if you have ever had a chance, Carol, the man who became Pope. It's the best movie you can watch on YouTube for free. It's about three hours long, so have a nice bottle of wine or scotch or a nice cigar or your pipe or simply comfortable chair and go through because it's very terrible it's very well done it's describing all the struggles and persecution that he went through as a young priest in Poland what the communists tried to do to him all the way to what happened at the conclave that obviously it will never be confirmed but it was whispered by some cardinals that attended that conclave especially that scenery where carol was sitting on the in the sistine chapel with all the other cardinals and all of a sudden he looked down at his shoes and he realized that his shoes were old used beat up and also a little dirty and then he looked to his left and he looked to his right, and the other shoes of the other cardinal instead were shining, polished, and brand new. Bruno Magli shoes, like O.J. Simpson. <laughs> and when he saw that, he pulled his feet under his cassock because he felt unworthy to be there. But then, the narration in the George Weigel biography got it from some anonymous cardinal is that Cardinal Koenig that was the Archbishop of Vienna, Wien in Austria is the one that went to Cardinal Wyczynski, the primate of Poland and said to him you know this war between this Italian Cardinal Syrian, Cardinal Benelli is not going well what about a Pole? And Cardinal Wyczynski looked at him and said, I'm too old. <laughs> and Cardinal Koenig said, we are not thinking about you. <laughs> he stood up and he said, but he is too young. Nobody knows him. And Cardinal Koenig replied, we know him. He has a brilliant mind and he has, is a man of prayer and his life is centered and founded on the Eucharist. But we are afraid that he's going to say no. And Cardinal Wyczynski said, I'll talk to him. And in the movie, you will see the scene when he goes to Carol and Carol is in this little cell as they used to be, you know, in the apostolic palace, conclave, cum clave, closed in, you know, they are closed in, they get to beat each other off until one stands and gets called to be a pope. And when he approaches Carol, he looks at Carol, Carol stands up and Cardinal, Cardinal Wyczynski looks and says, do you remember the movie Quo Vadis? Remember the movie Quo Vadis? It was the first movie Charlton Heston came out based on the book. And when he said that, just Quo Vadis, Carol turned and knelt down in front of a crucifix that was right there because he knew that his time was coming. And so in 1978, he again, as I said, heard the voice of the Lord and his deep faith, his confidence in God's help in the crucial events of life, as well as what I say, 
the total surrender in the maternal help of the Blessed Virgin Mary was the animating force of his papers. But tonight here in Pilan, let me just clarify that being a pope is not an average job, right? <laughs> As a matter of fact, it's actually not technically job, it's a vocation. Because if driving here, I would have seen, a, you know, there are so many signs out, but if I would have seen a, a sign, Father Vaughn for Pope. Eh! I was saying, there's something wrong. Or even if I would have seen a sign, Father Vaughn for Bishop. Eh! There is something wrong that I will call his dad, and I will say, we got to talk about your son. <laughs> but technically, it's not a job because it's a vocation. Because you don't decide to do it. You are called. And it's not easy to be a pope because the world closely watches us and analyzes us every move that the pope makes, every word that he speaks, recent facts, right? He said something in a documentary, Pope Francis, you know, and now they're taking it, tweaking it, cutting it, putting it out with an agenda, and finally, somebody today said, hey, wait a second, I don't think that that's what he said. Let's go and see what he actually said. So you understand, no matter what you say to a body of yours or during an anomaly, somebody's going to dissect it and reattach it and put it into a new narrative. It is brutal. It is, as I usually say, standing in the fisherman's shoes is all consuming. And my sense from having lived and worked in the Vatican, and of all the cardinals that I met, is that no one of them actually wants to become a pope. It's much easier to be a cardinal than it is to be a pope. A friend explained to me, as a young Swiss guard, that one of the reasons why pope changes their names when assuming their ministry is not because it's cool, but because their previous life is over. As we heard before, as Jesus told Peter in John 21st verses 18, and I quote, you will be taken where you do not wish to go. End of the quote. I arrive at the Vatican as a young Swiss guard with a largely secular understanding of Catholicism, which was my parents' fate, but not truly my own yet. And that outsider view was both helpful and deceiving for me because I was able to meet St. Pope John Paul II without any preconceived notion. In other words, his impression on me was not filtered through my perception of his office, but purely based on a human level. Now, let's be clear. To become a Swiss guard, you have to be from Switzerland. And Switzerland is not Sweden. There is always this confusion. Oh, I'm, you're from Sweden. No! Swedish fish are candy from Sweden. In Switzerland, we have Rolexes, we have chocolate, and we have lots of pharmaceutical company. I'm sure that all the drugs that you are taking, 93% are coming from Switzerland. And I was not born in Switzerland because my father, working for a pharmaceutical company, at the big, in the early 60s, he was transferred from Basel to Milano. Milan, Milan, northern part of Italy. And he met a lady who was a clerk at a law firm, my mom. They got married, and in the mid-60s, I came alive in Italy with dual citizenship, Swiss passport because of my dad, and Italian passport because I was born in Italy. But where was I born in Italy? I was born and raised in a tiny village between Milan and Bergamo, 
And the name of the village, it's three Italian words, Sotto il Monte, under the mountain. Guess who was born in that village beside my mom's entire family and myself? Saint Paul John the 23rd. I come from his village. So imagine my joy on Fe uh, April 27, 2014, when in St. Peter's Square, and I was there, Saint, uh, Pope Francis canonized on the same day the man that I protected as his bodyguard, Saint Pope John Paul II, and the man that I dated two of his nieces, Saint Pope John XXIII. <laughs> Growing up, I was an only child, and uh, very full of energy and full of life. And my, uh, one of my professors in graduate school was a priest whose name was Luigi Giussani, Don Luigi Giussani, Father Luigi Giussani. Why do I say this name? Because he's the founder of Communion and Liberation, CL. Some of you might know Opus Dei, Communion and Liberation, all of these apostolates, okay? And Don Luigi Giussani was my professor in graduate school. And the two of us didn't really get along on the definition of the word relationship. Why? Because for me, relationship was Mario with his girlfriends. And for him, the meaning of the word relationship would have been Mario with God. But I didn't really like that vertical relationship. I liked that relationship within the proximity of the people that I was spending time with. And at that time, in life, in graduate school, in order for me to make some money, you know, I couldn't be a bus boy because there aren't bus boys in Italy, okay? But because I worked out, because I had long blonde hair, yes, you don't believe me, but it is true, I used to wear them in a ponytail, okay? And because I used to work out and I'm tall and I was handsome, I still am raggedly handsome, okay? <laughs> I was a model. That's how I made money. I made money walking up and down stages wearing clothes, Sometimes just a speedo, but hey, what the heck? <laughs> They're paying me for. And at that time in life, my friends were some American woman. I'm going to throw you a name. They don't remember me for sure, but I was proud that Cindy Crawford knew my name. <laughs> that Linda Evangelisti knew my name. That Ellen McPherson knew my name. Well, for some of you, it might mean nothing to me. I meant a lot at that time. So you understand that I was definitely always walking on the edge of getting into trouble, right? <laughs> and it's my dad that when I defended my doctorate, my dad pulled me aside and he said, you need some structure in life. And I said, no, I don't. I live at home. I don't have to pay for utilities. Mom does all the cooking and washing. I drive your car that you pay for. I don't need any structure. I am fine as I am. <laughs> well, I disagree, he said. And here is your choice. You have to join an officer school, either of the Swiss Army or of the Italian Army. And I said, okay, that sounds hard. But let me look into it. And so I looked into both schools and the Swiss Army officer school, 17 weeks long. And the, Swiss, and the Italian Army officer school, 54 weeks long. It was a no-brainer. <laughs> but when I chose the Swiss Army, I should have paid attention to the fact that my dad, side of his mouth, went up a little, you know, like, got you. But I didn't really pay attention. But trust me, the Swiss are crazy. <laughs> they have a navy. There is no ocean in Switzerland. How can you have a navy if you don't have an ocean? <laughs> they have a submarine on a lake. Can you imagine a submarine going around pikes and trouts and bass? I don't get it. So when I arrived 
in Geneva, I was wearing my Rolex, my Montclair, my Levi's, my Clark shoes, everything original, like a bonbon, like a candy. <laughs> I arrived there with my ponytail, no braid, but you know, just up there, coming down. And that gunnery sergeant that was probably coming out of one of the Rambo or one of the commandos of Schwarzenegger movie, four feet and 11 inches tall, came, looked at me, and all of a sudden, he disappeared. And then I felt that he pulled my ponytail and chucked nine inches of my hair off in the train station with a Swiss knife. <laughs> and I thought, this is not going to be good. <laughs> they put me on a wagon. We went up into the mountain. At a certain point, I kid you not, the mountain opened. Almost like when Moses saw that the water split, I saw the mountain opening. And then we went into the mountain, and all of a sudden I realized, gee, this is where they did Goldfinger, the James Bond movie. <laughs> there were like 2,000 men in there. They put me in a room, 12 by 14, 36 men on triple bunk beds. And I took the bunk bed at the top, which means during the 17 week school, I slept in an MRI. <laughs> I wasn't able to turn left and right. They didn't give me a ball to push so that they could pull me out. It was awful. But while I was there, one day a Lieutenant Colonel pulled me aside and said, Mario, we've been looking at your resume. We got heard that in Rome, the Swiss guard are looking for somebody that it's really you and uh, you should consider it. You will not have to pay your grade here. You can go there. Do you know who the Swiss guards are? Well, I do know, but thanks, no. I don't picture myself dressed up as a clown, <laughs> standing still on the cobblestone in Rome, without talking to anybody. And he said, well, you just gave me a little slice of the job description of the Swiss guards. But you know, when you become a Swiss guard, first and foremost, you acquire a noble title. When he said that, I thought, gee, I'm gonna become a Duke. Sir Mario, <laughs> sounds awesome. And he said, you know, it's three Latin words. Well, my undergraduate is in classics. So when he said three Latin words, I said, please tell me the words. Defensores Libertatis Ecclesiae, protectors of the church's freedom. So when he said that, I thought, hmm, who's trying to take the church's freedom away? But most of all, why? Must be serious if the Pope has 150 Swiss guys protecting him and the church's freedom. I think I should give her a shot. And so, after the 17 weeks, I went to Rome, did a six weeks training, and then started my job. And the first time I met St. Pope John Paul II, I was in a room I had seen him, you know, from far away, but never interacted with him. And all of a sudden, he's coming up and then he's curving in front of me and I go into attention and he stops. And he looks and he says, you must be a new one. <laughs> and when he said that, I came out of attention. You know, I don't know if some of you are soldier, but you don't talk unless they talk to you first and then you can engage in a conversation. So I came out of attention, I took my white gloves on, I went as a man, and I shook his hand, and in seven or eight seconds, I introduced myself, my name and where I was coming from. He kept my right hand in his hand, and then he pulled up his left hand, and he sandwiched my hand in between his hands. And he looked at me, and he said, well, thank you for coming to serve who serves. And he let go of my hand. 
and he walked away. That day was my first ever encounter with the authentic meaning of servant leadership. It was so shocking that moment that I started paying attention almost in a stalking way to what he was talking about, how he was presenting, how his gesture, his posture, how he was interacting with the sick. I really knew that that man had something special that I wanted, it, but he didn't come out immediately what that was. I knew that he did, that I wanted it, but I didn't know what. And so I had to pay attention. And one day, like a few months later, I am in the Apostolic Palace in probably one of the rooms that Father Vaughn went when those pictures are taken. And uh, at the end of this audience, His Holiness and his secretary were supposed to leave from another egress. And instead, they started walking where I was to go out from my door to my right. And uh, don't ask me why, I have no idea. When they arrived very close to me, like the lady is right now, they stopped. And they were talking in Italiano, in Italian. So two Polish priests, a Swiss guard, and they are speaking in Italiano. And they know that I am there, but, you know, I am a Swiss guard, so I'm like a Pole. You know, it's part of the being in there, all right? And because the two are talking in my proximity, it's not that I'm going to do... Blah, 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 blah. Uh, uh. And guess what? They're speaking in Italiano. That's my mother tongue. I'm going to pay attention to what they're talking about. <laughs> so, St. Pope John Paul II was telling Monsignor Gibic that during the night, he had a dream. And during that dream the Lord told him loud and clear that he had to change the way that he was leading the church. Can you imagine in front of a nobody like I am, they're having this conversation. And he said, continuing, that the Lord told him that the Pope must suffer so that Everyone in the world will see that there is a higher gospel, the gospel of suffering, with which we must prepare the future. When he said the word il futuro, the future, he put his chin down. And then like five seconds later, he put it up again and he saw me. And when he saw me, he looked at Monsignor Givic, Don Stanislao, and he, he made the sign, let's go. And they walked by. I was completely cut off guard in that moment because I started thinking, what, what did he have to say? There are no cameras here, no journalists. What is this story about a dream? But why does he have to suffer? Isn't being a pope already trouble and hard? What, what is this? He's not a trappist that he prays on cobblestones and fustigates himself. What? He's not a Cartesian that they wear the fur jacket. What, 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 what is he talking about? Oh, maybe he's joking. Oh, maybe he's just saying something just to say it. So I tried to console myself thinking that what I had witnessed and what I had heard was nothing important or even real. But the Lord disagreed with me because a couple of weeks later, he had gone to the hospital to remove a benign cancer that he had in his colon. And my service was such that I did not spend any time at the hospital, but I was waiting for him when he came back. I was in the courtyard of San Damaso, and he arrived with the car, 
and I was standing right where the elevator is, you know, protocol, and the Mercedes stopped. I am up. The butler comes out and opens the door. And his holiness is right here, so I'm standing like here, and he's right where the stand is. And he put his right foot off, the left foot off. He grabs with both hands some of us. That's how we get out of the car, right? And he pulled himself up. And when he pulled himself up, because he was weak, you know, he had lost weight. He looked pale. Everybody does after a week in the hospital after a surgery. He lost the balance. And in order for him to not fall back into the car, what he did, he took two steps to the rear of the car so that his butt went against the side of the Mercedes. You can picture this, right? Well, when he did that and he rested against the Mercedes, his left hand went down and the butler closed the door. Because he didn't see where the hand was. And finger five, four, and three, thwack, which, you know, it's a one and a half inch bulletproof glass, so it's a heavy door. The butler immediately realized, open. And St. Pope John Paul II took the hands out and put his chin down. And he didn't say a word. In front of me, he put in action what he had said in front of me a couple of weeks before. He didn't scream, he didn't yell, he didn't judge, he didn't criticize, he didn't throw a temper tantrum. He sucked it all in. That's how it is to live with a saint. What they say, they actually mean it. And yes, you understand that during his pontificate, you can understand that during his pontificate, I had an extraordinary example of human greatness because of his apostolic vigor and because of his authentic faithfulness. But at the same time, he was a funny dude. <laughs> he loved to show his gratitude for our Petrine service to a point that sometime he would uh, joke around with us. Like that time that we were in Castel Gandolfo, the summer residence, and four of us, we were playing cards outside on the portico, typical granite table with the granite benches, you know. We are playing cards, Flask of vino bianco, white wine, salame, which pieces of lard are as big as nickel. You know, you know the Italian, typical Italian snack four in the afternoon to get you ready for dinner. And all of a sudden, my guard, my partner, puts down a card that was not the card that I wanted, and I said a bad word. And as soon as my bad word left my mouth, Boom! The zucchetto, the cap of his holiness arrived in the middle of the table. And the four of us, what? So we looked up, and his holiness was on the balcony above us, and he looked at us, and he went up with his hands, and he said, oops. <laughs> there was no wind. So he threw that cup. I grabbed it. I looked up, and I said, can I keep it? Sure, I still have it. <laughs> so he was a very special person, as I'm trying to explain to you. He was gifted with an enormous ability to communicate, but most of all, with a brilliant intellect. And those of us who had daily contact with him, we were always struck by the richness of his intuitions, by the depth of his spirituality, by the example of his prayerfulness, but most of all, by his immense humility, which was rooted in his intimate union with Christ. And it was his humility, I'm convinced today, many years later, which permitted him 
to continue to guide the church and to give an eloquent message even toward the end of his pontificate. And some of you probably remember 2005, few days before he passed away, at the window, at the Angelus, where he tried to say a word, but not a word came out of his mouth. He was not ashamed. He tried. He wanted us to see that moment so that he will be tattooed on our souls. The kingdom of suffering. One day, again, apostolic palace service. I was hot, I was tired, I was thirsty. They call me, His Holiness is coming, there is a protocol that you have to follow. And the protocol is, you know, close the door, block the elevator, make sure that, you know, nobody walks around. There are people working in the apostolic palace. And here is a little secret for the people in St. Patrick Parish. St. Pope John Paul II shuffled. You know, he had Parkinson, and as a Parkinsonian, you cannot lift up your legs easily, so it's easier to walk like this, all right? And so he shuffled, and shuffling with his moccasin generated a sound that it was very clear for us to calculate the distance, how many feet it was, and the grow of intensity, he was coming closer so that we could go in attention, you know, almost a mechanical reaction. And that specific day, because I was tired, thirsty, my feet hurts, I really wanted for him to stop and just say, hey, how are you doing? You know, acknowledge my presence there. And so he comes, the, the, the sound grows, I go in attention, and all of a sudden, he passes and goes away. And he doesn't look at me, absolutely nothing. And so I remain in attention and I closed my eyes, feeling sorry for myself. And I kept my eye, God bless you. And I felt my eye, she has no COVID, eh, by the way. <laughs> we have to be careful. And so, um, and I closed my eyes, and maybe two seconds, and when I reopened my eyes, he was in front of me. I did not hear him shuffling back. Certainly, he didn't jump back, but he was in front of me. And St. Pope John Paul II had this awkward 10 seconds of silence staring at you. He would come in your face and look at you without saying a word for 10 extremely painful seconds. <laughs> and there I am in my attention with him looking at me. I'm 6'2", he was 5'9". And he was looking at me with his blue eyes of an intensity of a blue that I still did not identify in any other human person. And I noticed that he was putting his right hand in the cassock pocket. And then all of a sudden, what did he do? He took a rosary out, exactly this rosary. He, put, he took exactly this rosary out. And he kept it in finger one and two, and he put it in front of my face. And I'm still there in attention, and now he's there with the rosary. And he says, Mario, the rosary is my favorite prayer. Marvelous in its simplicity and profundity. Take my beats. And when he said that, I came out of attention, and I went like this. And he put them in my hands. And he said, and make them your most powerful weapon. I closed my hand and I stayed there and he turned, he took three steps, then he stopped, he turned, he looked at me and he said, welcome to adulthood. <laughs> and never be afraid on calling on Mary. And he walked. You know, calling on Mary. I'm going to talk to the few men in the room. We, are, we as men, we are not calling on Mary enough. This is the most powerful weapon. This is a sign of authentic masculinity. It's not just Father Vaughn and his dead duty to carry a rosary in their pocket every day. It's our, as well, our ladies 
already do that. We don't. Imagine if we as men, the men here in St. Patrick, if we will go out and be honored to show our most powerful weapon. If we go out and tell 10 of our friends to do the same. Imagine if we as men, we will start calling on Mary on a daily basis. As John Paul II told me. Imagine if we start calling on Mary, what the immediate effect could be. But we are too busy, aren't we? Aren't we so upset when we send an email and somebody does an email back for maybe three days? And then he or she said, I'm too busy. Well, when they say that, I'm a professor, so I am allowed to. I always say, excuse me, ants are busy. A-N-T-S, ants are busy. Don't tell me that you are busy because you have no idea what it means to be busy. You are incapable of managing your time on prioritizing and so on and so forth. I'm a professor of management. I'm allowed to do that. The truth is, what St. John Paul II inspired me is to call on Mary every day. And I start probably five rosary a day, and if I'm lucky, I finish one. My pajama pants have a pocket so that I put my rosary in my pajama pants so that if I don't know what to do, I put my hands in my pocket, I feel the beats, and I start saying a rosary. You know how many of my friends, male, they tell me, oh, do I do have a rosary? My grandmother gave it to me in 1976 when I did my first communion, and it's in my nightstand drawer. Why? Put it in your pocket and start calling on Mary because the moment that you will call on Mary, she will turn you from a pessimist into an optimist. She will turn you from timid to being daring. She will turn you from being feeble-spirited to be a man or a woman of faith. Who's going to clean up this mess in the church and in the entire world? The government? The bishops? Mary will! But if you don't call on, how can she react? Totus tuus. This was a mystical Marian devotion toward that figure that St. Pope John Paul II had and he called the mother of God. And it is not a surprise that we, Swiss God, we were drawn to mother. As Dante in the Divine Comedy describes like this in the Paradiso, in the Paradise, chapter 13, and I'm going to read it to you because it's beautiful and says it all. Dante in the 13th century, this is how he talked about Mary. Lady, thou art so great and hast such worth that if there be one who would have grace, yet be taken not himself to thee, is longing seek it to fly without wings. The longer the only father prayed, the more absorbed he stayed in prayer to a point that he seemed like he was completely taken up into another world. Like if nothing and no one in the room could pull him back from the place that he had. So one day we were in Castel Gandolfo, summer residence, very intimate because we will go there all summer, but also a few days after Christmas and a few days after Easter. Pope Francis doesn't go there. But that, this episode happened after Easter, and there was His, uh, his Holiness, His Secretary, one of our nuns that she cooked, and six guards. And I was the senior of the six, so I was in charge, all right? And we will go to Mass at 7 a.m. with him in the chapel. And then we will not see him until dinner. And then he will eat with us. Three o'clock in the afternoon, I get a phone call from uh, the HQ, the headquarters, saying somebody just left the Vatican. They're going to bring some document that His Holiness needs to see. 
please make sure to welcome the person, the courier, and give them to His Holiness or put them somewhere where His Holiness will see because he's aware of these documents arriving for him. Okay, sure enough, the courier arrives, I get these binders, two binders, and I'm thinking, okay, so it's 3.30, 3.45, His Holiness is probably, you know, either resting or maybe he's in his office writing, studying, reading, whatever. I'm just going to go up, I'm going to go down into the living room and put them there on the coffee table so that he will see or his secretary will. I don't have to disturb anybody. So I'm not wearing a uniform because everything was shut down, no audiences, wearing a suit. And I'm walking down this narrow hallway where on the right side there were all the windows looking in the courtyard, and on the left side, behind every door, there is either a room or something that I know. And halfway down the hallway, I stopped because that's where the chapel was. And I grew up always making sure that if that's a chapel, that means the Blessed Sacrament is there, therefore you stop and you adore. And that's what I did. You know, I stopped, I turned, and I just bow for a moment. And when I got up, what did I see? St. Pope John Paul II was kneeling in the middle of the chapel. And he was grabbing the slack of the altar with his hands. And his forehead was resting in between his hands. When I saw that, I thought, what's going on? And so I took two steps inside the chapel and I looked left and right if perhaps there was a photographer or if they were making a documentary. I don't know. But there was absolutely nobody there. I took a step back. I turned and I went down to the living room. <clears throat> I put the binders down. And when I walked past the chapel again, I did not dare to look inside. Eight o'clock, so just less than five hours later. He had no dinner with us. I didn't blame him. Our sister was not a good cook. <laughs> the secretary calls and says he wants to go for a walk in the garden. You know, big wall, all the carabinieri outside, so nothing to be worried about. But we, all six, we have to go for the walk. And because I was the senior, I was not, you know, details. You know, I was not walking next to him. I was in anticipation, so I, bought, I was about 25 feet in front of him. And I kind of walked with another guard, defining the path. I've done that walk, so I knew exactly where we were. And when we arrived at the fork, I thought, oh, that's where the pond with those big red fishes are, I'm sure His Holiness wants to see them. And so I stopped exactly at the fork, and so did the other guy. And His Holiness, when he arrived, he will wear tennis shoes. Kind of cute, you know. He's classic in tennis shoes, all right? He turned, and he started walking down this path to go to the pond. All of a sudden, he stopped. And he turned around, and he was obviously looking for something or someone until he saw me. And when he saw me, he started walking at me, and it was so clear that he was walking at me that the other five guards, they basically took a step back saying, yours. <laughs> and there I am, no uniform, so I don't have to do the salute. I'm wearing my suit, and I'm thinking, okay, I wonder what he needs, what he wants. So I'm trying to process this in my brain, and he arrives. This is after he gave me the rosary, you know. So now I know he's not going to talk for at least 10 seconds, so let's just wait. And instead of keeping my hands behind my back, I kept them down next to my body. And all of a sudden, he grabbed my left wrist where I wear my watch, and I thought, what's going on? And by the time that I thought what's going on, when he grabbed it, he pulled. And when he pulled, I wasn't expecting that. And so I almost lost the balance, you know, so I had to contra with my torso because I wasn't expecting that. 
But when he pulled and I found myself bent, my head went right in front of his face and I turned it and he whispered in my right ear while he kept me, Mario, why don't you join me next time? And then he let go of my wrist. And when he said that, I thought, what? He started walking, I was confused. Wait, I passed him, I started walking in front of him, and for the remainder of the walk, I thought, he wants me to join him to do what? <laughs> Wait a second. Does he want me to join him in prayers? Wait a second. How does he know that I saw him in that intimate moment of prayers? I don't wear Chanel number five. <laughs> the chapel didn't have a Nest camera with an app that records who sneaks in and sneaks out. How did he know? But that made me think. It made me think that we have to remember that prayer is what drives us closest to the Lord. I'm a simple guy born in Sottolmonte that arrived in New Hampshire in 2010 when my father-in-law passed away. My brother-in-law is a priest, not in New Hampshire, but in Denver. He was ordained a couple of years before Father Vaughn, 2001. Why didn't he become a priest in New Hampshire? I don't know. But he felt called to go to Denver. I'm a simple guy, but to me, the fact that St. Pope John Paul II, who knew my name, had a devotion to Mary and prayed many hours a day. Mother Teresa, who was a close friend of mine, and yelled at me and insulted me to set me straight had a relationship with Mary and spent a lot of hours on her knees. Blessed Alvaro del Portillo, which he was Jose Maria Escrivar's secretary, and he was the dean of the Opus Dei movement, is the one that introduced me to cigars and scotch. <laughs> He's the one that told me that authentic men only drink Glenlivet 25. He forgot to tell me that that's $400 a bottle, but that's not a problem. <laughs> he also spent a lot of hours in prayers. Carlo Acutis, you all know who he is. He was beatified last week. I've known his parents all my life. So I'm constantly telling the Lord, okay, God, two saints know my name, a blessed Drive, drove me to vices. The father of a blessed did very questionable banking transaction with me. What is that you want from me? Please help me to understand. And every time I say that, my heart, my mind goes back to an expression that I heard St. Paul John Paul II say many times. And you know what that was? Be more. Be more. Be more. John Paul II didn't say do more. He never said go and do more. But he said often go and be more. I am the guy that once during a late afternoon... I found myself with him and I asked him why he had chosen do not be afraid as his biblical passage. Yes, I also asked the Dalai Lama if he was wearing panties under his clothes. <laughs> so I'm a Swiss guard. I'm allowed to ask anything I want. I didn't know that that's what ladies wear. So oops. All right. And I ask His Holiness why you chose do not be afraid. You know what he said? Mario, we cannot be afraid because God is always one day ahead of us. 
That sums up the theology of 27 years of pontificates, I'd say. They want out there. Everybody wants us to be afraid, right? Afraid of living, afraid of dying, afraid of everything. Are we going to allow them to win? So for me, Mario Ensler, these two words, be more, that's where I reroute myself. That's where I go all the time. When I'm angry, when I'm hungry, when I'm upset with my five children, when I'm upset with the faculty, I'm a dean of a business school right now in Houston, Texas. Okay? And in Houston, Texas, you have to be careful because everybody carries at least two guns. <laughs> Not just one, at least two. Sometimes even three. I've seen a guy with two here and one there. All right? <laughs> and you don't want to get anybody upset because if you take your little gun, it's going to take a big gun out. So I've been pondering and reflecting and sharing. I teach priests and bishops a lot. Trust me, when I teach at 37 bishops for one week from 7 in the morning until 9 p.m., I get home and I'm exhausted because teaching to 35 or 36 bishops at the time, at the same time, you're teaching with somebody that tells you, well, tell me what I don't know already. Okay. All right, we're going to start well here, okay? They're telling me to tell them what I don't know already. So, to be more what I, Mario Ensler, think that that means is that we have to rediscover the beauty and the power of our own charisma. And the reason why we have to do that is so that we can remember the no gift given is meant for oneself, but it is given for what? For the good of the church and its secular dimension. That gift given for some of you is financial strength, for some other intellectual strength, for some other physical strength. Guess what? When you're going to die, you're going to leave all your money behind, all your strength, and all your books are going to stay behind. But if you try to be more, if you've been trying to be more, if you're going to start now try to be more, imagine that you will be fulfilling a call dear and near to John Paul II. New evangelization. It was a call that we must receive this condition of self-giving as absolutely essential so that what? We don't fall into the error of using the truth. Come, come Holy Spirit, leave me alone because I'm fine as I am. But come, but don't touch me. I like my 401k my double digit performance, all the wine, I like it, but come, but don't touch me. <laughs> A lot of us are doing that. You know, the last two minutes, I just want to tell you that St. Pope John Paul II, and I want to, you know, make you laugh, and at the same time, I want you to think about it, okay? The reason why I wrote this book that's called I Serve the Saints, so I wrote the foreword on that book, Okay, that Jason called me in 2015 when the Pope was being canonized and asked me to write the foreword. Why did Jason call me? Because Jason was living in Denver. Who was his pastor? My brother-in-law. <laughs> Very small wall, right? But last year it came in my heart that nobody was doing anything to celebrate the centenary of his birthday. And so you wrote a book, I Served a Saint. I Served a Saint www.iserveasaint.com I made a page of a website and why did I write that book? Because I want people to rediscover who St. Pope John Paul II is. Your children, your grandchildren, eh, I don't think that they really know who he is. We need to go out there and reintroduce him or help people to rediscover him. And that's why I wrote a simple book, 130 pages. I'm not a writer, but many people kept saying, why don't you put some of your stories all together? And I put it. So 
yes, impacted my young life in profound ways, laying the groundwork for my becoming an husband, 20, almost 28 years, a father of five, two girls and three boys, aged 25 to 15, a businessman. I was in the financial world for 20 years before I came to New Hampshire. I lived in Hong Kong, lived in London, lived in Switzerland. I moved around like a ping pong ball and my wife is still the same. At professors, I created, when I came here and I left the business world, my wife and I were homeschooling and we ended up opening a classical education school in Claremont, New Hampshire. You probably don't even know where Claremont, New Hampshire is. I barely knew where Claremont, New Hampshire is. Today, the Vicar General lives there, so Father Vaughn, we need to be very careful, all right? But, Father Sean, hi. But, I fell into education. I opened a school in New Hampshire, rooted in the Catholic tradition, and then from there, I got a phone call, and I moved to Washington, D.C. to become a finance professor at Catholic University of America, and recently, during this time of hysteria, when I was coming to an end of my four-year contract, I got a phone call from Houston, from St. Thomas University, and I accepted to become the dean of the business school in Houston. That's why now I live in Houston. But to me, yes, becoming a father, becoming a husband, becoming a businessman, becoming a professor, but mostly important, a practicing God. It was his example that inspired me. It was his words that gave me hope. His ideas that provided direction to my life. So tonight, in conclusion, here in St. Patrick, I encourage you, please, become spiritual Swiss guards. I wish I had a pin to give you. I don't. But please become a spiritual Swiss guard. And what, what do you have to do? Well, because I'm who I am, I said, let me give you four principles, four guidelines that are easy to remember, and you can carry them with you and share them tomorrow at the grocery store or at your Pilates class. <laughs> I know that some of you are doing Pilates. That's... First principle to become a spiritual Swiss guard, don't waste time. You don't know when God is going to call you. Might be tonight. So don't waste time. Don't let your life be barren for crying out loud. Make yourself felt instead. And shine forth with the torch of your faith and most of all of your love. Love your priest. How many times you thanked Father Vaughn for being a priest? I'm sure many times you say thank you, but you don't mean for his priesthood. You are saying thank you just because he probably put the flowers that you liked the most, or he sanitized his hands after he gave it on the communion on your tongue. Why don't you just say thank you for his priesthood, for his saying yes? Because St. Pope John Paul II said, Every time you look at a priest, not at the deacon, forget he's dead. <laughs> Every time you look at the priest, you catch a glimpse of how Jesus looks like. Have you ever thought about that? So instead of criticizing the priests, why don't we start telling them how much we love them? And then we prove that and we show that. So don't waste time. The second, embrace sacrifice. I'm sure that many of you are already sacrificing, but it's not enough. Be more. Embrace sacrifice because we all know that a vocation demands self-denial. But how pleasant the sacrifice turns out to be if that self-giving is complete. And authentic. So, don't waste time, number one. And number two, embrace sacrifice. The third guidelines or principle to become a spiritual Swiss guard, pay attention to the little things. 
I know that you are bombarded all the time to the big vision. Yeah, let's look at the macro and nobody looks at the micro. Let's focus on the big and forget the little. I'm reversing that and I'm going to challenge you to pay attention to the little things. You know why? Because St. Paul John Paul II did. Because St. Mother Teresa did. Because it's a very important quality in that way so that you can become a master of yourself first and consequently, without even knowing, you'll become a leader for others. So start paying attention to the little things. And if you don't care about becoming a leader for others because you're an introvert and you feel comfortable in your comfort zone, well, then just think this. That's where the devil hides. The devil hides in the little things. Can you tell us what two little things are? Sex and money. Very simple. How many men, they came to me after the mechanic situation, and they came, we are going to go, and we're going to put our bishop in line, and we're going to go and beat up our priest, and make sure that we take all the booze that he has in his cabinet, and dump it on the street. I said, okay. And I said to some of the men, are you going to do that after you watched porn the night before? No, because if you're going to watch porn and then in the morning you're going to go and try to set the priest straight, you just lost it. So you see where I'm going. Pay attention to the little things because if you don't care about leadership, that's where the devil hides. And please be aware that the devil, it's real. And the devil is been out to destroy what? Fatherhood. Think about it. First, he wanted to destroy biological fathers, right? Husbands and fathers. How many do we know of fathers that are gone? Devil one, biological father zero. Then he wasn't happy. Then he went to spiritual fathers. And he started attacking priests, right? We all know. Devil two, spiritual father zero. And where is he right now? Who is he attacking? The spiritual father of the church, the bishops. And he's also there winning. So we've got to do something here, my friends. Pay attention to the little things. And in conclusion, always stay humble. As I said, it was his humility of St. Pope John Paul II that drew my attention. So always stay humble. Because if not, all of your fame, all of your talent, all of your eloquence, all of your power is going to be worth nothing. Remain humble. And God will help you so that you will be able to begin working for Christ in the lowest, lowest place in his army of apostles. And that's where the Swiss guards are. Become a spiritual Swiss guard. Don't waste time. Embrace sacrifice. Pay attention to the little things, but always stay humble. Be more, my beloved new friends. Let's tonight here in Pelham receive this condition of self-giving as absolutely essential for an authentic Christian life. And I'm going to leave you with Hebrew verses 18 of the 11 chapters. And I quote, The primacy of our faith and the courage that it generates must lead each of us to obey the call of God and to set out not knowing where we were to go. End of the quote. Thank you very much for coming and let's conclude together with El Mary, full of grace. The Lord is with thee. Blessed are thou, woman, women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. 
Only Mary, Mother of God, pray for our sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Saint Pope John Paul II, pray for. Thank you very much and good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Just a reminder, please leave your kneeler down as you're leaving your pew so we know where to sanitize. You got that, right? Okay, so back to Mario if you have any questions. If anybody has any